Thank you. So good morning to all of you. Uh, so in fact, um, the reason it was mentioned so little is uh, I should warn you in advance that microlensing is, is really the black sheet of exoplanet studies. <laughs> and the reasons are that it seems very complicated, therefore the results are, are suspect. There's this uh, uh, belief that there's no follow-up, whatever that means, we'll talk about that, of, of planets, and therefore it's not really useless, you know, and in a very fundamental scientific way, the, re the results are not reproducible. Um, as we'll see how, how microlensing planets have been discovered until now, uh, we s it's, it's in a very chaotic kind of way, and, and it's been argued that, therefore, everything we find is statistically useless in terms of learning about the planet, planet population. And in the end, to date, only something like 50 planets have been discovered with this technique, as opposed to the thousands and thousands from other methods. So you know, what's the point? Um, so I'll already show you the, the answers to, to these questions um, that, that, that show that all these, all these criticisms are not completely valid. Uh, we'll show that actually things are not that complicated. It's quite simple. Uh, and the complexity that you see <coughs> is actually good. It's a good thing because it, it gives uniqueness to the models. Uh, it's not true that follow-up is not possible. It is possible and it is done. And the way that these things, that microlensing surveys are done these days, uh, are actually quite, it, uh, could, could be called controlled experiments. This is the generation two experiments that we'll talk about. Um, and in terms of the planet yield, yes, it's true that it's small, but uh, the planets found by microlensing are very unique planets. They probe a very important part of planetary parameter space. Um, they show, they find planets at separations of a few AU, what in our solar system is, is the, the snow line region. So this is a system that's uh, a region that's unique to microlensing as opposed to other methods that look at things very near with transit or radial velocity or very far with direct imaging. Um, and it's sensitive primarily to stars around M stars, which again are not probed that much by other methods. Uh, plus, in the end, we'll, if we'll have time, we'll talk about that it's the only method that's, uh, that's sensitive also to free-floating planets, planets that have been ejected from their systems. Um, it seems like we're seeing them with microlensing. Uh, it's the only method that can really see planets not only in the around very nearby stars, but throughout the galaxy, both in the disk and in the bulge. So many, many advantages. Okay, so um, we'll start with the very basics. Uh, and be because of the technicalities of the this, of this subject, it'll take some time until we actually reach the subject of planets. So bear with me. Um, okay, so uh, lensing in general uh, in astronomy means any situation where we have bending of light. Okay, for example, in this uh, famous picture by Matisse, we see every goldfish twice. There's only four goldfish there. Well, we see uh, four images, multiple, eight, eight images of goldfish. Uh, and of course, we know why that is once we see uh, the rays that come directly from each fish, but we also see the rays that have been refract refracted at the surface and bent towards us. Okay, so often when we have bending of light, we can have multiple images, and we'll see that with, uh, with, with gravitational lensing as well. Okay, but if these are lensed goldfish, then this is a, an astronomical example of a lensed quasar. Oops. Okay, again, multiple images due to the same effect, light bending. That's, that's all you need in geometrical optics. 
So uh, the whole subject uh, began of gravitation lensing began in 1919 with the famous observation of the eclipse, the solar eclipse, uh, which was the first uh, experimental uh, test of general relativity, test which it passed. <coughs> so this is the sun in, in negative, uh, uh, obscured by the, by the moon. So it's, it's, it's nighttime, and you can see stars projected near the disk of the sun. So these uh, blue points are the actual measurements by one of the expeditions that I went to observe this event. Uh, and the red points are where these stars would have been had the sun not been there on the line of sight. So you see that all the stars have, been, have moved out. They're, they're moving away from the solar disk. Okay, but I've cheated here. The movement is actually a factor of 100 smaller than what I've plotted. It's about one arc second. Okay, while the diameter of the sun is about 1,800 arc seconds. So, so it's a much smaller effect. Um, <clears throat> but uh, actually, this, is, uh, this, this, uh, this observation, which is the first observation of gravitational lensing, is what made Einstein famous. He was a well-known physicist by then uh, in, in 1919. It was after uh, special relativity and GR. Uh, but he wasn't a public figure, and he overnight became a, a, a public figure after the eclipse, eclipse observation due to this story in the, in the New York Times. And then, of course, it went exponential from there, culminating in his being crowned the person of the century uh, at the end of the 20th century by Time magazine, even though most people don't really know what he did, but he's still the most important person <laughs> in the 20th century. So, and it's all thanks to gravitational lensing. Most physicists don't know that, that, that. That's what made Einstein famous. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see how, how lensing works in general. Okay, all you really know, you, one of the nice things about uh, lensing, especially microlensing, is that you don't need to know anything from GR except one very simple formula, which is this. This is uh, the deflection angle that a light ray undergoes when it passes within a distance R of a mass M. Okay, very simple. And there's the 4 and J Newton's constant G and s speed of light squared. Okay, so what does this mean? Let's say we have some sort of light, source of light, a star, say. Okay, and we're here on Earth. Okay, normally the star sends light rays in all sorts of directions, but including in our direction. That's why we can, on Earth, we can point at the star and say that it's, it's there. Okay, that the light is coming from there. Okay, now let's put some mass between us and the star. <coughs> And according to this formula, light rays that pass very close to the mass will be deflected by a large angle, right, small r. Okay, and those that pass at a larger distance from the star will be deflected by a large angle. Okay, and of course there will be a Gold Goldilocks ray that will be deflected just by the right angle to reach us. Okay, and um, therefore we will see the source not where it really is, but in that direction because that's where the ray is coming from. Okay, but, and uh, this is that alpha, that's the deflection angle that's written up on top. And here's the R, that's the impact parameter. And of course we can see from symmetry that there's another ray that also passes at the same distance R and also reaches us. Okay, so we have two images, but of course there's actually a circular symmetry here. The rays that come out of the board also will reach us at the same angle. Okay, so we understand that uh, in this situation, the source will be deformed into a so-called Einstein ring. Okay, like this or like these. These are real images of actually galaxies in the middle, lensing background galaxies into these perfect Einstein rings. <coughs> um, okay, now, uh, all this is true. This, this, uh, this formula comes out of GR in the limit uh, of weak fields. Okay, weak fields means that this, you can see that up to a factor of two, 4 gm over c squared is just the Schwarzschild radius, okay? So r, the distance b at which this ray is passing from, from, this, from this point mass, <coughs> is much bigger than the Schwarzschild radius. That's another way of saying that the field is very weak, okay? Um, so one, one, one uh, regime where this applies is that this, it, we're in the weak field limit. Okay, but that automatically means that this angle is small. Okay, it also means that this distance, r, is much smaller than the other distances in the problem. Okay, the, for example, these distances. Okay, otherwise this angle and the other angles in the problem would be small. 
And in optics, that's called the thin screen approximation, okay? That all the, whole, all the deflection, you know, you don't have this kind of gradual bending, you know. All the, all the deflection happens as if, you know, in, at one point. Um, so all these, all these, all these uh, limits are really the same limit, okay? Weak field or small angles uh, or thin screen. Okay, so we'll, we'll, ne we'll use that shortly, especially the fact that it's short angles. Okay, so this... This, uh, the angle of this ring that's formed on the sky, that the source is deformed into, let's call it the Einstein angle, theta Einstein. And uh, let's calculate what its size would be. Okay, so let's put some distances in the problem. Put the distance between us and the source, DOS, between us and the lens, uh, DOL, and DLS, that's between the lens and the source. You know, some of these two is, of course, the one in the bottom. Um, so now let's look at the, at the left-hand side at these, this line segment IS uh, uh, that's shown there. Okay, so IS on the one hand, because we have uh, these, this small angle approximation, we don't have to bother with uh, sines and tangents and things like that. We can say that <coughs> SI is just alpha times DLS, times the distance that's, that's shown down there from the lens to the source. Okay, but it's also equal to this angle, theta Einstein, times the whole distance, dOS, right? So now let's uh, put, instead of alpha, the formula we got from GR up there, okay, right here, where I've replaced R, again, with the angle, theta E, times dOL, okay? Otherwise, it's the same thing, okay? Now we can see that theta Einstein appears here and here, so let's uh, isolate it take the square root, and we get this important formula, which is the size of this Einstein angle, the, 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 rate, the, the angular radius of the Einstein ring. And you can see that it depends on this uh, ratio of distances, not so important, but mainly it depends on the mass to the square root, to the one-half power. Um, and if we actually put some... Uh, some typical numbers here, for example, if our lens is a solar mass star, for example, something of solar mass, okay, and let's say our lens is uh, halfway between us and the source of light, okay, so D, DOL equals DLS or, or D, DOS equals twice DOL, okay, then this is, this is the kind of numbers we get. And let's put, let's put our lens, typical galactic distance of a star in the galaxy of 10 kiloparsecs, then we get that the radius of the Einstein ring that the background star will be deformed into is about a milli arc second. Okay, one part in a thousand of an arc second. <coughs> and uh, this is the same formula. Uh, and uh, if, uh, for example, our lens is at, say, something like that at eight kiloparsecs, uh, then this corresponds to a physical size in the lens plane of about 5 AU. Okay, that's just like the orbit of Jupiter around the sun. Okay, and this is important to, to remember for what will come, on, come up later. Okay, so this, this ring that we see around, uh, around the star, if we could see it, whose size is a milli arc second, that's about where Jupiter, normal solar-like, solar system-like Jupiter's would be. Okay? Uh, Well, they're just as good as any others, yeah. Oh, but given the numbers, just given the numbers of stars and their brightness and the statistics. Well, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll see, we'll see that, you know, we, we don't get to choose the stars that do microlensing. Nature does that for us, and we'll see that they're mostly lower mass stars because those are the most common. But it's a good point we'll get back to. Okay, now uh, we, can, we can look at other situations where we have lensing in general. Okay, for example, we can look at stars not in our galaxy, but at, at very distant galaxies, say at a Hubble distance. So if we, if we replace this by, uh, you know, 10 gigaparsecs instead of 10 kiloparsecs, and we have here the square root, <coughs> then the angle will be a micro arc second. And actually, this is the source of the name microlensing, because when people thought about lensing by stars, they were originally thinking about lensing by stars in distant galaxies. Okay, so... That's why this is the micro arc second here. Okay, and that name is stuck even though, in fact, when we usually talk about microlensing nowadays, 
we're talking about this situation, about stars in our own galaxy, and the Einstein ring is a milli arc second, not a micro arc second. That's just a historical quirk. Okay? Uh, we also have uh, galaxy lensing, where the distances are big, but the masses, instead of one solar mass, are, say, 10 to the 12 solar masses. And again, there's a square root, so it's 10 to the 6 times bigger, so we have uh, Einstein rings that are about one arc second in size, like this one. Okay, this is again a galaxy lensing a background galaxy into an almost perfect Einstein ring. <coughs> and we can make the masses even bigger, say a hundred times bigger if we look, go to a cluster of galaxies. Okay, so M will be 10 to the 14 solar masses or something like that. And then we'll have Einstein rings of, uh, of size 10 or tens of arc second, like, like the, the partial one that we see here around this cluster of galaxies. Okay, so, but the important thing to remember is that the Einstein uh, angle really sets the scale of the problem, okay? And it's dependent on distances, we saw, but mainly on mass, on the square root of the mass. Yeah, there's a question there? No. Um, okay, so let's go back to, now to this uh, simple geometrical optics diagram. That's all it is, okay? And now let's break the symmetry. Let's, let's assume that our source is not directly behind our lens. Okay, so things get a little more complicated now. As seen on the sky now, the source is at an angle beta relative to our lens. Okay, and now this, this is the particular ray that will, will be the Goldilocks ray that will be bent just right to reach us, and then we'll see the, an image of the source at this angle. There won't, no longer will be a ring Okay, because we've broken a sy uh, the symmetry, okay? <coughs> and if we want to calculate this uh, angle now, okay, then we'll again go to the left side, and you look at these two line segments, AS and SI+. Plus. Their sum is, of course, AI+. Plus. Okay, just, just the length. And if we, again, we'll do the same kind of, uh, of exercise that we did before with small angles, okay, we, re we, we can represent this one with, DLS times alpha, right? SA, the bottom, bottom line segment is DOS times beta, and there's some DOS times theta. <coughs> and uh, let's uh, isolate, B, we have DOS both here and here, let's isolate beta, so we get this equation here. <coughs> and again, let's put instead of alpha, our formula for the deflection angle, just like we did before. And now, <coughs> if we look at the, th this thing, by the way, is an important equation. This is the lensing equation. It's really all you need in order to do lensing. Okay, it's just a geometric, it's, it's again, just the geometrical optics with, with, small, with small angles or with thin screen approximation. If, if we take the right hand and the left side together, beta and this side, okay, we can see we, 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 we can get an, a quadratic equation for theta, okay, that appears here. Okay, and, and so again, the, theta is, uh, is, is the angle where we see the, the lens image of the source uh, rather than where it really is. And quadratic equations, of course, have two solutions, okay, and that tells us that there's, there's, there's not just one ray that reaches us, there's two. Okay, there's one from the other side too. There's a positive and a negative solution. And here it is, you know, with a formula we've all been using since, since high school. <coughs> okay, so whenever we break the symmetry, we have two images, two lensed images around a point mass. <coughs> so how is this thing going to look on the sky? Okay, so here are, here's our source that's off axis, off the optical axis of the lens, using again uh, terms from, from optical geometry, uh, and the two images. Uh, so how will this look on the sky? Okay, this is, uh, this is where our uh, lens is. Okay, this is where our source truly is. Okay, but it's been moved on the sky away from the lens. Okay. Now, because it's been, every part, of the, every part of the source has been moved radially away, it gets stretched into these two bananas. Okay, so we always get bananas when we lens uh, circular sources uh, by a point mass. 
Uh, and as we said, the whole, the whole scale of this thing is about a milliarc second on the sky if we're talking about lensing by, of, by, of stars in our galaxy by other stars. Um, this is, by the way, this is the cluster lensing image I showed before. This is the kind of thing that we see here. Okay, here's one banana. I don't know if you can see it. There's another banana here. Um, okay, so let's again now look at this uh, from the quantitative point of view. Okay, so here's uh, our, <coughs> our lens here. This is where our source really is, and these are the two bananas. So let's give them sizes. Okay, we said this, is, this angle is beta, and then the angular extent of the source, the true angular extent of the source in the sky, we'll call it d beta. Okay, and then this thing gets stretched into the two bananas at theta plus and theta minus. <coughs> and... Um, Let's uh, calculate what is the magnification of this lens, okay? Just like uh, magnifying glasses, just like glass lenses, gravitational lenses magnify or demagnify. Uh, we'll see that both possibilities are, are exist, okay? So the magnification of each of these uh, images, let's, say, let's look at the top one, okay? There will be two elements to its magnification. One is the tangential magnification simply be by the stretching into these bananas, okay? And that'll be just the ratio of the radii, right? Of the angular radii, of theta to beta. Okay, so that's this thing here, theta divided by beta, okay? But also the width can change, right? It can shrink or it can grow, okay? So that'll be just d theta over d beta. In other words, the derivative, okay? But that's easily calculable, right? Because we already have a formula that we know we got from, the, from solving the quadratic equation, okay? So we just have to take the derivative of this relative to beta, very easy. <coughs> and we'll stick these, uh, these two factors, right, the, the tangential and the radial uh, shrinking or stretching, okay, and we get this formula for the magnification of uh, the top and the bottom images, okay, and this is what it is. It's not very pretty, but it's easy to get it. <coughs> now, there's a fundamental theorem in GR that says that Gravitational lensing conserves surface brightness, okay? So you have a source, say a star with surface, first, let's say uniform surface brightness, and now you put a lens on the way to it, it'll appear bigger, okay? But the surface brightness has stayed the same, that means that overall it's gotten brighter, okay? More light gets to you, and that makes sense because the lens is, is sending our way all sorts of rays that wouldn't have gotten there had, had the lens not been there, okay? So... Magn in, in gravitational lensing, magnification equals amplification. Okay, that's the reason why I'm, I'm marking this with this A. Okay, that's for amplification. And that's the amplification or magnification of the two lensed images, the two bananas. Okay? And we can also look at what is the total magnification. It's just the sum of these two. Okay? If we divide what we get, uh, if, 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 we, if we express... It, Instead of using beta, we, we normalize beta by this uh, Einstein radius, Einstein angle that sets the scale of the problem. Then we get this rather simple formula for the total magnification. Okay, and this is what we can actually measure because remember that whenever we have microlensing of stars by stars, the scale is a milli arc second. That's much too small to resolve with any optical telescope, and microlensing is, a, is an optical phenomenon. Uh, since stars emit optical light, not other things, generally. Um, <coughs> so we won't be able to measure the actual splitting of the images, but we can measure the amplification. Okay, Okay. now, with that same formula that we had before, okay, the total amplification expressed in terms of U, this normalized uh, position on the sky of beta. Let's call it the impact, per the, 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 the separation on the sky in units between the lens and the source in units of the Einstein radius. Okay, now let's add uh, dynamics to the problem. Okay, all the stars are moving because of the random motions, because of the orbits around the center of the galaxy. So let's imagine now we have here a lens. <coughs> this is its, uh, its, its Einstein radius that's determined, remember, by the distances in the problem and by the mass of the lens. And now because of the mo motions of us, the observers, and the lens, and the source, the combination of all this is going to produce uh, a movement of the source 
behind the lens across the sky. Okay? And because of all these uh, factors, in the, in, the, in the lens plane, in the, le in, in, in this, uh, in the projected lens plane, uh, there will be this velocity, okay, some, we'll, we'll assume it's constant, uh, because everything, all, all this happens on, on small time scales, okay, so it's just a constant velocity, okay, and therefore the length of this, uh, this line segment here, time it takes uh, to cross from the point of closest approach of the source behind the lens, till it crosses the Einstein radius is just V time as a function of T <coughs> to every point here, divided by DOL. Uh, this is V divided by DOL, just what you, we, we normally call the proper motion. As we would, if we could see this happening on the sky, if it was all resolved, this would just be the proper motion uh, of the source relative to the lens. <coughs> and uh, now we can just use Pythagoras theorem and relate this beta fs, this is the angle of closest approach on the sky between the source and the lens. This is the separation at a given time, beta is a function of t, and this is this function of v. So if we, we say just, the this just, this is DOL. Well, everybody's moving, but we, we, we look at the apparent motion as if it was in the lens plane. <coughs> the, you know, the, 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 ma the main thing that might be moving is actually us, okay? But everything moves on the sky, okay? So if we, if we just, uh, you know, say, say that uh, uh, this, this thing, beta of t, okay, is the square root of this squared plus this squared, okay? That gives us beta as a function of time, okay? We divide it by theta e, that gives us u as a function of time, we plug it into this formula, and we get a, a, closed, a closed expression for the total magnification as a function of time. Yeah? Uh, I guess it's important to notice that when beta equals zero, uh, which would have an imperfect alignment, uh, magnification would be infinite. Infinite, yeah. exactly. And it is. Yeah. It is, yeah. Wow. Okay? So, yeah. So, let's, let's look at two things, actually. Well, one, st one step back it's before that. Well, yeah, we'll discuss why not, okay? But formally, it is infinite, okay? So, so first of all, okay, we have this, this uh, function of v the, of t that we, we plug into here, and this is, uh, this is clearly an even function, okay? Because uh, uh, u, u appears here squared. Um, so, so this, uh, this is going to describe something that rises up to a, a maximum and then falls back. Another thing you can see is that if we're talking about u's that are smaller than 1, okay, meaning it's a situation like I've drawn here, that the, the, the source is passed within the Einstein ring, okay, uh, you know, not, not out here, for example, or, or going out here. So if u is, is smaller than 1, then we can uh, neglect u next to the 4 here, right, because it's u squared, and next to the 2 here, okay, and then we have two cancels out with a two and we have just one over u. Okay, so to a good approximation, <coughs> the, ma the, the peak magnification uh, will be just uh, one over this impact parameter. Okay, and you can see that in these uh, several typical uh, so-called Pachinsky curves that show the total magnification as a function of time. So you see that for, uh, for impact parameter, the lower one, of 0.5, you know, that's more or less the case that's drawn, then the maximum magnification is, is about 2, you know, 0.3 it's about 3, and for 0.2 it's about 5. Okay, so it's very, very simple. Okay, now, <coughs> these are the kind of things we're actually going to measure when we observe microlensing. Remember, we don't see the actual splitting, we can just measure the total magnification, okay? And what can, what can we see, what can we actually measure from these curves? It's only two things two interesting things, or even one interesting thing, okay? One is, is just the amplitude of this thing, the, the, P, the, the, the maximum of this thing, but that's not interesting at all from a physical point of view, because we saw that all that it shows us is how close the source passed behind the lens. There's no, inf no useful information there, okay? The, the useful information is only in the time scale of this thing, okay? Because the time scale holds in it the, the Einstein radius, this theta Einstein, which in turn 
depends on the mass, which, what, which is what interests us. Okay, so before we go s a bit more into that algebra, uh, let's look at this nice simulation of how these, such a lensing event actually looks in time, if we could see it. Okay, so what we have here is our lens. This is this yellow star. This is its Einstein radius. Okay, and the source, its true position, is, is shown by this red uh, circle here that's passing behind. And here are the two blue bananas, the two lensed images that appear when the source uh, is close enough. It starts here. We have the point of closest uh, approach. Then we have the maximum magnification. And then it goes uh, in reverse in the same order uh, as before. Okay, and what we have plotted here is actually uh, the magnification, okay, the ratio of the two areas of the two bananas relative to the true angular size of the source, okay, and that gives us this uh, Pachinsky curve. So let's go back now to the question of the time scale. Okay, what is the time for the source to cross this uh, Einstein ring? <coughs> it's very simple. It's just the radius of the ring, which is the, the angle times the distance to the lens, divided by this V that we have in the problem. Okay, or again, V over DOL is just the proper motion, right? It's how many arc seconds per year, or milli arc seconds per year, or whatever, uh, the, thing pa the, the source passes behind uh, the lens. Okay, and because of the dependence of theta E on, ma on mass, on the square root of mass, this whole thing depends on the square root of mass and on distances and other things, uh, and the velocity particularly, okay? But, but in principle here, we have some kind of measure from the time scales of the mass of the lens. Um, and again, let's look at some typical numbers. <laughs> if we we'll put, again, our lens somewhere towards, say, the center of the galaxy at uh, 8 kiloparsecs, and we'll take typical random velocities we have in our galaxy of 20 kilometers a second. And it will, if we'll use as our lens uh, a, a solar mass star, uh, then the time scale comes out to two months for this thing to go up, okay, and then another two months to go down. Okay, that's the Einstein radius crossing time scale. If, on the other hand, we'll take something that's a thousand times less massive, a Jupiter mass lens, <coughs> then because it goes like the square root, it's 30 times uh, less, it'll be just two days. Okay, so much faster going up and down. So this already tells us that just from the time scale, we can learn something about the mass of the lens. That's also assuming small u, yeah? Because it's small what? Small u, a small impact parameter. Because if you're toward the edge of the Einstein ring, then you'll pass by. That's right. So we're, we're never going to deal with cases where we, we pass outside, because then you can actually go, go to the formula for the total amplification and see that if you're right at the, when, you're, when you cross the Einstein uh, ring, your magnification is just 1.34. Okay, if you just plug in u equals 1, which is not very much, okay? It's a very, we usually won't even notice such events. They'll be lost in the noise. Okay, so uh, here's the formula again for theta Einstein, okay? And what you can see here uh, right away is that if all we measure really is tau, this time scale on the event, you know, just the, the width of this thing, <coughs> it's going to depend on uh, theta Einstein, which depends on the mass and on the distances and on V. Okay, so there's three physical parameters and we're measuring just one thing. Okay, th I say three because we usually know the distance to our source. We can see the source, we can see what kind of star it is, and therefore we can estimate where it is. Okay, and, and one distance is just, it's just the difference between the difference distance to the source and to us, but the lens distance we won't know. Okay, so, uh, so we have a degeneracy. We have a single observable that depends on a, some combination of three physical parameters. The mass of the lens, distance to the lens, and the velocity, the effective velocity at which the lens crosses, the source crosses the, 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 the lens in the lens plane due to the, all the motions in the problem. Um, yeah. Well, we don't see the images, remember. These are much too small, a milli arc second. No, no telescopes can do that. So all we measure is these light curves. Okay, that's a handicap we have to live with. Um, okay, however, there, there is hope, yes? Milli arc second or a micro arc second? I thought it was the micro arc 
No, it's milli arc seconds. Uh, micro is, is for historical reasons. It would be micro arc second if your if your lens star was in a very distant galaxy. But in our galaxy, it's it's always a milli arc second of of order. Okay. However, uh, there is hope, and there, and uh, these degeneracies can sometimes be removed by what we call high order effects, or by uh, follow up of the event after long long after it's over. Okay. <coughs> The first uh, high order effect that, that is useful is, is, is called finite source, uh, the finite source effect. Okay, you, so you can imagine we have this situation that we've drawn. This is one point during the lensing light curve. Here's our point source and here's the lens. Okay, but a, a different situation is that, is that the, f the source has a different size. Okay, it's not point like, it, has, it always has a, a certain size um, <coughs> and it can have different sizes. Okay, depending on its size, the uh, magnification curves will look different because different parts of the source are at different distances from the, the set lens, right, which is a point mass. Okay, so they get magnified by different amounts, and therefore we don't get this perfect uh, Pachinsky curve that we had before. Okay, this is a, a real example of a microlensing curve. Okay, ignore this for the moment. Okay, the, the green, green curve is what you would see with a, with a perfect point source, okay, but because the point is extended and different parts of it get magnified by different amounts, especially near peak, you get this smearing out, okay? And if you actually measure this, and w what it tells you is this ratio between the angular size of the source on the sky, again normalized by this Einstein angle. <coughs> and since we know what the true source of, this, of the source is, because we can see what kind of star it is, uh, this can be used to uh, remove degeneracies. Um, actually, I, I forgot to answer the question about the infinities, but, but this, is a, this, this is perhaps the place to uh, explain it. Let's go back. Okay. While the formula, in fact, diverges for, uh, for a point that's exactly at the, at the center of the, r right behind the lens, uh, this is true only for one geometric point, okay? And uh, any real star from one point has zero flux, okay? So there's only one point with zero flux that obeys this infinite magnification, okay? And that doesn't give us anything. All other points in the star are always not exactly at this, what we will later call this caustic, uh, and therefore they get finite magnification. So the ma magnification is, in fact, always uh, finite. It can be very big, as we'll see. Uh, but it is fine. Okay, so this is one high, uh, high order effect that we can use. Uh, another one is uh, microlens parallax. There's two kinds of parallax. Here again is a real microlensing curve. Uh, this is uh, the dashed line is, is the actual symmetric curve that's described by the formula we derived before. Okay, but the, act the real uh, form, uh, the observed form of the microlensing is this uh, place, this, this curve where the data points are. And the reason for this is that this is a quite a long event. You'll see this is a time and day, so this has lasted uh, of, of order a, a year or so. Okay, and during during this time, the Earth is accelerating around the Sun. Okay, so it's changing its velocity, and that V that appears in the formula changes during the event. This is called orbital parallax, and because we know the direction, the, the movement of, of of the Earth around the Sun we can use that to remove the, uh, the degeneracies, uh, partly remove the degeneracies we talked about. Uh, there's another kind of parallax, it's the trigono trigonometric parallax, parallax that, that is the kind that you're all familiar with. And we can nowadays observe microlensing events from two widely separated points. For example, in this case, from the ground, this light curve here, and from the Spitzer spacecraft, which is about one AU trailing behind the Earth. Okay, and from that perspective, <coughs> the peak and the impact parameter of the event are different as viewed from Earth. Okay, so just like in uh, triangulation of stars that we do using parallax, uh, this can be used also to determine basically the distance to the lens. Okay, so this is uh, trigonometric parallax. Again, can be used to remove these degeneracies between the physical parameters that we talked about. And finally, uh, another way to, to remove the, the, this degeneracy is, is to actually go back to the event uh, a long time after, a few years afterwards, and look for the lens star. During the event, as we'll see, 
usually the, 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 the lens itself, the thing that is doing the whole thing, uh, is, is, is completely, uh, uh, it's, uh, what's the word? We're, we, we can't see it because we're blinded by the light of, this, of the source in the background that's been magnified. Uh, but if we wait long enough and we go back to the field and image it with high resolution, we can sometimes actually see the lens. Okay, so this is the actual uh, image of the microlensing event. Okay, and this is where the, we know that the uh, lens is. And after a while, we go there and we can actually see it. We can measure its light. We can see what kind of star it is. And therefore, uh, we can deduce what its mass is directly. And plus, we can also sometimes measure its proper motion. Okay, if we've, we can see actually see how much it's moved from the original location and f use that to, to, to constrain V in that equation. Okay, so uh, <coughs> let, let's uh, make an historical interlude now. Uh, go back to the eclipse of 1919. Uh, Well, you can set an upper limits on it then when you're deriving your parameters. That's true. Well, well, well. Okay. Yeah. That's right. You want you want all of them. That's right. Uh, okay. So so we know that Einstein. Uh, uh, this was very important to him, you know, as the first test of general relativity. How do we know that it was important to him? Because we know that the, the very same day that he heard about it, he wrote a letter to his mom. Okay, so here's the, uh, uh, he's a good Jewish boy. So you, you, you read the English translation here, and I'll, I'll practice my German reading. Liebe Mutter, heute eine freudige Nachtricht. H.A. Lawrence hat mir telegrafiert dass die englischen Expeditionen die Licht Lichterblenkung an der Sonne wirklich bewiesen haben. Okay, so he was, you know, <laughs> as soon as he heard the set today, you know, the very <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, the very same day, the, the rest of the letter is, is, uh, is about the mother's health and, <laughs> and uh, you know, seine Albelt. Okay, so he did care a lot about this, this first instance of gravitational lensing. Actually, it was the first instance of microlensing as well, because we heard that microlensing is lensing of, a star by a, of stars by a star, right? And, and the sun is, of course, a star. So this was also microlensing. Um, but we also know that he didn't care much about any other application of gravitational lensing, and specifically microlensing of stars, other stars by, by other stars, as we're discussing now. And we know that because uh, here's a sketch from Einstein's notebook, 1912. This is three years before he published uh, GR. Okay, this is before he had that famous factor of two right yet. Okay, and here are the exact same kind of diagrams we've been drawing. Okay, so he already figured all this out in 1912, but he did nothing with it. Did nothing with it for, for uh, 20, 24 years. Uh, and then... Uh, when he was already in Princeton, this man, Rudy Mandel, uh, came into the picture. Uh, he's shown washing dishes because that was his job. He was a Czech, Jewish Czech engineer who emigrated to the U.S. in the 1920s. Uh, and he worked for the next decades as a dishwasher in various third-rate restaurants. And, uh, but he, read, uh, he kept on reading on GR and on, 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 on <laughs> various effects. <laughs> between the, in his leisure time uh, and he started uh, and, he, and he had this realization that a star could lens a star another star so he uh, nagged various scientists that he could get hold of he went to um, the, 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 the offices of the journal science and he tried to get a paper on this published uh, and you know they, they at first they, 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 they wanted to throw him out the, the, out the door but then they said, well, you know, maybe this is, uh, you know, we can make a story out of this. So they actually gave him money to go to Princeton to visit Einstein. So he went to Einstein. Einstein re received him courteously, uh, but told him, uh, you know, this is, there's no, no way that this can be observed. And, you know, 
basically threw him out. But this guy kept on nagging Einstein, both <laughs> by mail and <laughs> nagging the editors of science, uh, who in turn liked, liked the whole story, so they nagged Einstein. And eventually, uh, Einstein very reluctantly, and probably to, to get rid of all these <laughs> obnoxious people, he, he redid his calculation from 1912. Here it is in his 1936 notebook. He calculated the same things again. And after much prodding, he published this paper in 1936. Okay, lens-like action of a star by the deviation of light in the gravitational field. And it starts, some time ago, R.W. Mandel paid me a visit and asked me to publish the results of a little calculation which I admitted his request. This note complies with his wish. <laughs> and then, and then he, he works it out. And, and, he, and he emphasized in the paper that there is no great chance of observing this phenomenon. Okay? And then in a private note to the editor, he wrote very condescendingly, let me also thank you for your cooperation with a little publication with Mr. Mandel squeezed out of me. It's of little value that makes the poor fellow happy. Okay, so... So Einstein, we'll see, was, was very wrong about this because this publication actually started the whole field of gravitational lensing uh, in general. And it took 30 years until uh, actually any gravitational lensing uh, phenomenon was observed, 40 <coughs> years. Uh, but why did he say there's no great chance of observing this phenomenon? Well, it's because he calculated it. He, in, 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 that, in, that, in that same notebook uh, page that I showed, let's, let's repeat Einstein's calculation. What is the chance that a star at some distance L is microlensed by an intervening star at any given moment? Okay, so this is a very simple calculation. The number of stars that are passed to within Einstein radius uh, on the line of sight to the background star, because we, as, as we said, in order to get any significant lensing, your source has to be more or less within the Einstein radius. Okay, so that number will just be your density of stars times some cross-section, and times the distance to the source, the distance that you pass. Okay? More realistically, you have to do an integral with the, the dependencies of these things on, on, on distance. This is good enough for us. Okay, so if we assume a typical situation in our galaxy, okay, then the mean number of stars is, let's say, one per cubic parsec. And for the lensing cross-section, we'll take just pi times this Einstein radius squared. Okay, that's the Einstein disk. Okay, so <coughs> uh, we said that, uh, that at a typical distance, it's like 5 AU, okay, so 10 AU squared. Um, in, the, in, in parsec squared, it's 10 to the minus 10. And let's put our source, say, at the near the center of, our, of the Milky Way at a distance of 8 kiloparsecs. Okay, so you just uh, multiply these three numbers. You can easily see you get 10 to the minus 6. One in a million stars are lensed at any given time by an intervening star. So Einstein was right. There is not a, not a what did he say? Not a, no great chance. One in a million is no great chance. He's right about that. Um, but uh, what Einstein didn't realize is that uh, the photoelectric effect, for which he got the Nobel Prize, uh, also led to the development of, uh, of transistors and digital computers and to CCDs, digital imagers, which, with which millions, many millions of stars can be imaged at once. And then all the digital data can be fed into a digital computer that looks for these, these very peculiar, the very specific uh, lensing curves that we, that we saw before. Okay? And this became possible in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, surveys for microlensing started. Uh, these are the first microlensing light curves that were discovered in 1993. Uh, this was looking at stars in the, Magi in the Magellanic Clouds in an experiment that was intended to see if the dark matter in our galaxy is made of some compact objects that were called machos. Uh, they did see some events, but it turned out later, uh, eventually, that, that these, this is really lensing by, of s stars in the Magellanic Clouds by other stars in the Magellanic Clouds and not by some intervening masses. Uh, but nowadays, uh, more than a thousand microlensing events are detected every year uh, by looking towards the galactic bulge. In fact, the optical depth is something like one in a million, but if you look at many, many millions or even a billion stars, you can, you can get many, many events. And the events follow very closely, perfectly really, this, uh, this curve that we derived. Okay, so here are two events. 
<coughs> and uh, here, here's another one. Okay, this is just looking at the peak. I mean, look at how those data follow that curve. So this is this is definitely happening. Um, okay, so just uh, just to give you an idea of how this happens, uh, here's a field towards the center of our galaxy. It's the densest part of the sky, so you can monitor the most stars in a given image. Plus, there's the highest chance of another star passing along the line of sight. Uh, so this is the best best uh, place to do microlensing. It's probably the only place to do it. Uh, so if we'll just zoom in on this region, you can see an actual uh, microlensing uh, event. You don't, re don't see it in the actual images here, but, the, but you do see it in the difference image where you subtract this image from a reference image that you obtain. You have a, a, that same field, okay, and everything subtracts out except the difference, the brightening of your source star due to the lens star that's passing in front of it. Okay, and you actually do this, um, okay. So, uh, we've used up a, a long time. We haven't mentioned planets yet, so now let's, uh, let's add planets to the picture. So let's look at uh, this, uh, again, a real, real image on top where you see the star uh, brightening due to microlensing, but then there was this flash, and there's another flash, and then it goes to the regular peak that we see at the bottom. Okay? What we've seen here uh, is the signature of a planet around the lens star. And this is actually the first, the first case of this in 2003. So here's our reconstruction, again, with these plots that we had before, of what happens here. Okay, so again, the source is here transiting behind the lens. Okay, and here are the two lensed images, the two bananas. But then one of the bananas passes close to this planet that happens to be here. Okay, and it gets split into additional multiple images, and that causes these, uh, these, these spikes in the light curve. Okay, so it's, it's not quite what you would have guessed if I would have asked you, well, what does a, a lensing by a star plus a planet look like? Okay, it has these, this funny behavior, which we'll understand shortly. <coughs> this, these are the actual data for this event, okay, in the first uh, microlensing planet. It's a Jupiter mass planet. Uh, we'll talk shortly about how we know that. Um, and here's another one. Okay, this is, this is probably what you would have guessed uh, the, the microlensing light curve of a star plus a planet looks like, right? It's just normal lensing due to the star, and then there's this little blip here. Okay, that's the planet. Okay, but we'll see that it doesn't always look like that. Sometimes it looks like the previous example. Okay, and sometimes it looks like this. Okay, this, this double horn on top of the peak of the, of the lensing uh, light curve. <coughs> Sometimes you don't even see it by eye. It's only when you subtract out the point model, the, 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 the light curve of a, of a point lens, then you see that it has this residual, which is telling you that there's a planet there. <coughs> Here's uh, the first example of a two-planet system that was discovered uh, with microlensing. Uh, the light curve is even more complicated. Okay, there's the zoom in, zoom, zoom ins on various parts of it. Okay, and the reconstruction of this uh, tells us that it's 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 a Jupiter plus Saturn system that's very actually very analogous to the solar system. Okay, because if this is our solar system with Jupiter and Saturn in terms of distances and masses, uh, this is very similar just with everything scaled down by a factor of two because the lens star is an M star. It's just half a solar mass and everything is moved in. Uh, the, the planets are smaller, so it's a, it's a scaled-down solar system. It's very nice. And this actually illustrates the, the power of microlensing to actually see such things, okay, which uh, other methods are not that uh, <coughs> sensitive to. Okay, and, and just uh, not long ago, another two-planet system was found. So here it is. <coughs> uh, this is, uh, uh, again, somewhat analogous to the, to the solar system. Um, so... Um, let, let's uh, go back to these, these uh, images and try to see uh, th these simulations and try to understand how planets around a lens star perturb the microlensing light curve. Okay, so again, we see that what happens if we have a planet here, when it's when the image, one of the lensed images passes close to it, that's what produces that spike in the light curve right, because of the additional splitting. Okay, so now let's uh, see what happens 
when we move around the planet around the lens at different positions, projected positions on the sky. So you see that sometimes it doesn't do anything because no lensed image, no lensed image passes clo close to it. But when a lensed image does pass close to it, it does produce in the appropriate position on the light curve uh, this spike. Let's uh, instead now play with the mass ratio. Okay, we're growing a planet over here okay, and making it more and more massive. This is the mass ratio. So we're going all the way up to a binaries with Q equals 1. Okay, and we see that uh, both the perturbation becomes bigger, but also it becomes wider. Okay, because the, 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 rate, the time scale of this perturbation also goes like this, more or less, like the square root of the mass of the planet. Okay, and both the planet and the star at the same distance. So the ratio of the time scale of the perturbation to the time scale uh, of the whole event, square root, is like the ratio of the masses. Or ratio of the times is like the ratio of the square root of the masses. There's yeah. also the impact that would come into the time scale of the planet. Because when you no. talk about the time scale of the whole event being roughly when the amplification is 1.3, which is being twice uh, the time spent by the velocity, that's the whole event of the planet while the image is doing this quick move. And that's on a shorter time scale. That's right. So it's, so it's more complicated than that. I should, I should state right here uh, at this point that uh, we saw that lensing by one point mass is very simple and we got a closed expression for it. But as soon as you go to two point, la two point masses or more, then the, the problem becomes much, much more complicated. There's no analytic description of it. And, uh, and you get many, many complications that we'll, we'll see in a moment. Um, so the way these things are, are usually described, and I want to mention this because um, if, you, if you read uh, any microlensing paper, you, it'll be full of mention of this word caustic. So what are caustics? First of all, this comes from the, I don't know if it's Greek or Latin, but uh, uh, caust is, is burning. A caustic is a burning line. Okay, it's what you get when you take a broken piece of glass and you focus the sun on a piece of paper, it's what you see at the bottom of a swimming pool. Okay, those nice wavy lines, those are caustics. Okay, but formally, they are points in the source plane that get infinite magnification. If you put a source in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in, the, in the plane at the point where there's a caustic, that source will get infinite magnification. So we've already heard about one such point, <coughs> and that's the, the point that's just behind the lens uh, in a single point mass lens, right? Because a source that's just, just on the optical axis, right behind the lens, if we put it there and it's a point source, it'll get deformed into this Einstein ring. Okay, so a single point has been magnified into, you know, of, of size zero has been magnified into a ring that has a length. So we have infinite magnification in that case. Okay, so the simplest case of a caustic is just the point behind a point mass. Um, now, let's see what happens to caustics when we have two, point, two, two masses, two point masses. So if they're uh, very widely separated, as in this case, their separation is much larger than the, the Einstein radius of each, then their caustics are still these two points behind each one, but they're not quite points anymore. They've, they've been slightly deformed, as we'll see in a moment. But uh, to a good approximation, they are points. And then if we will now pass a source along the trajectory behind these two lenses that we see, uh, we'll, we'll get just the expected two no almost normal microlensing light curves. <coughs> and these are real data, actually, of, a, of such a binary, an equal mass bin <coughs> binary with a separation. Excuse me. Now let's bring... Um, bring these two masses a little closer, and now you can see what's happened to the point caustics that were there before for individual single point masses, point lenses. And you see they've been deformed and enlarged into these diamond shapes that are pointing at each other. Okay, and now when we have uh, the source passing this trajectory from the bottom to the top along this diagonal line, 
<coughs> then we get these kind of light curves where we start seeing these funny peaks and jumps that we saw before in the, in the planetary uh, microlensing event. Okay, and what we can see is that these, these peaks happen when we pass close or on top to one of these caustics, and particularly when we pass close to one of these so-called uh, cusps, if we'll look more closely at this, okay? <coughs> so these, uh, topologically, these things are described in terms of cusps and folds, okay? The long the lines are folds and the, 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 the pointy parts are cusps, okay? And the cusps have, when you pass close to a cusp, as you have here, you have particularly high magnification. If you actually cross a caustic, you have a discontinuity in your light curve because some parts of your star are getting infinite magnification, or at least very high magnification. Um, okay, if we bring now the, the, these two more or less equal mass stars even closer, okay, then you see that the caustics merge into this uh, six-pointed six star. <coughs> and now you can see that every time that the trajectory passes this thing, uh, we have this very sharp jump, you know, basically a discontinuity in the light curve. Uh, but before that, we have, when we pass close to this cusp here, we had this little bump, okay, a high bump, then the caustic crossing, this thing, and then the caustic exit. Okay, so the reason I'm showing you all this is just to give you some intuition as to how, uh, how, how these very complex uh, li microlensing light curves are formed. Okay, it's a result of caustic passages and caustic approaches. And the caustics themselves, their very complex structure, is a result of the fact that we have more than one point mass. Yes? Yes. That's, that's, a, that's a different way of looking at it. Okay? Here, here, here you're, you're looking at it in terms just of the where, where your source is. Um, in the lens plane, okay? Um, okay, and finally, let's uh, approach something that's closer to what's inter interests us. These, these two masses, as you can tell from their Einstein rings, their individual Einstein rings, are about the same mass, okay? But if we will make, make now one more massive than the other, then you see that this whole six-pointed uh, caustic structure moves towards the center of the more massive object, okay, very close to it. So you can imagine that if, if, if it was a factor, not like here, but a factor of a thousand is between a star and a planet, it would be even more extreme. Again, you have the caustic uh, crossings and, pass and, and cusp approaches and so on, as we had before. Um, and now if we go back to this animation that we saw for before of the first detected uh, microlensing event, and here's that same uh, six-sided uh, structure <coughs> that uh, you can see that these cusps happen, th these cusps in the, or these jumps in the light curve occur during these caustic crossings. Okay, so that's what's, that's, that's what's causing the whole effect. Um, <coughs> okay, now this is a zoom in on this caustic structure again. What you see here, again, this is what, what, what is actually plotted here is the actual magnification in in the source plane, okay, uh, that's what this grayscale shows. And so you can very clearly see this diamond-shaped caustic that we've talked about before. But there's also this central caustic structure uh, that's in here very close to the lens, okay? The lens here is here at zero, zero, okay? And there's a second mass, which is a planetary mass, much lower mass, which is out at 1.2, okay? So it's out here slightly outside, 1.2 in Einstein radius units, so it's slightly outside the Einstein radius. Okay, so again, the caustic structure has moved in close to the main mass. <coughs> and now we can imagine two situations, okay? One is that, let's say we have a passage over here very close to the, to the center of, to, to, to where the lens is, okay? This is very low impact parameter of, say, one in a hundred or something like that. Remember that the magnification is one over the impact parameter. So you can have magnification of hundreds. Okay, very high magnification. And remember, you're, you're moving very close behind the lens. Your two bananas are very, very big. They're stretched almost into complete Einstein rings. Okay, 
So basically, this is almost an Einstein ring situation. And then you can imagine that if there's a planet around the star anywhere close to that Einstein ring, it'll, the, uh, the, the light curve will be perturbed. Okay? You'll have an anomaly because the image is everywhere okay, along that ring, and it gets perturbed by the planet. It gets split and magnified. Okay? <coughs> On the other hand, uh, so, 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 one, so, so this means that uh, if we have a high magnification event, one with a very small impact parameter, it has a almost 100% efficiency to detect planets in the, in the Einstein ring region if they're there. Okay, so such, such events are very good for probing for planets around stars. Okay, on the other hand, look at this. Suppose with the same lens, the source transited here along this trajectory. Okay, so here too, uh, we would, you know, in this specific case, which is similar to what we showed before, we would get a, a signal. Okay, but if it happened that the trajectory passed here, or here, or here, uh, then we would get just a low amplification curve. You know, for example, if it passed up here at an impact parameter of 0.1, then the magnification would be just a factor of 10. But we would see no signature of, of, of the lens, of the, f of the planet, of the fact that there's a planet out here. Okay, so it's two different kinds of, uh, of, of events. Those that go near the central caustic that's in here, or those that go near the planetary ca caustics. <coughs> These are much more common, but they're much less efficient in terms of discovering lenses. Um, okay, so with that uh, understood, let me repeat again that the only practical way of actually calculating these light curves that I've shown is numerically through what's called inverse ray tracing. <coughs> the idea is that you imagine, you, you build a model, you imagine that you have your lens, your main lens, your, 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 lens, your host star, and it has some planet next to it of some assumed mass at some position, and that you have a source in the source plane behind it somewhere. You shoot out rays from you, this is why it's called inverse ray tracing, out towards the lens plane, at every point that your, your ray hits the lens plane, you deflect it according to that one and only formula that you need that we showed at the beginning for the deflection angle. Okay, so that's shown here. You go to the source plane with the appropriate distance, and then you ask, has my ray hit the surface of a star or not? Okay, if not, I throw it out. If it did, did hit the star, I look where in the star it hit. The star could have limb darkening and so on. Okay, so I take that little piece of the star and I count it. Okay, that, that, that ray does reach me. Okay, that's a Goldilocks ray. I count it in the amplification. Okay, I do this for every model. I do this for various positions as the source moves across the plane of the sky with a given velocity or proper motion. And I build a light curve. Okay, and I do this now for every possible combination of the masses, the separations, the positions on the sky, and so on. Many, many free parameters. So it's a very, very large parameter space that you search in order to find the one that fits your observed microlensing light curve. Okay, so it's, it, it is a difficult task, but there's no, no other way to do it. Right, you have to say, take a separation and an angle on the sky. Yes. <coughs> you, you, you need to take the mass of this and the mass of this. You need to take the distance of the lens. Um, the size of the source. The size of the source. So you can, you can add that in later to like, fine tune the model, but yes. The yeah. Into yeah, yeah, but that, those are things you can, you can assume that are known. Um, and, the, and the velocity, of course. The projected velocity, uh, which has two two components. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, okay, but but basically, once just to complete this, okay, once you identify those that do reach you, then you can. Uh, Essentially, you can draw the, the additional lens images, but all you really care about is, is not what the split images look like, but rather what is the magnification curve, what is the total amplification. Um, there was another question? Okay, so uh, one can ask, 
why, why bother with all this? Uh, why bother looking for planets with microlensing? Well, it's because microlensing really probes a unique region of planetary parameter space, as I briefly alluded at the beginning. Okay, so here's a plot I'm sure you've already seen several times during this school, and you'll see more times. Okay, so these are uh, more or less as of today, the known uh, planets discovered by all the different techniques, mass versus uh, separation. <coughs> So the green is the radial velocity, blue is the transits, uh, here's the imaging planets, a few pulsars, and the red ones are the, are the microlensing planets. So you can see here that there's only a few tens. And also shown here, as usual, are the solar system planets. Um, so first thing that you see is that uh, the microlensing planets cover a region that's, that's not very well covered by other techniques, so it's complementary in that sense. But also it's the re region that's most similar to the planets that we know and love in, in the solar system. Yeah, Scott. What sets the lower limit for the mass we can detect? There is no, in principle, there is no lower limit because as, as long as your image passes close enough to your lensing mass, it will cause an anomaly. And is it but, but, but it becomes very rare that this will happen, okay? So that, that's one problem. So if, if you take the, the, the cases that are probable, then you're in the end you're limited by signal to noise because if, the, if, if you don't pass very, very close to, say, to a, to a moon, okay, then it'll cause just a very small perturbation in your light curve, and therefore you won't see it in the noise. Small <laughs> perturbation over a small time. And, so and a small also time. A I, ex exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yes. But, you know, one of the reasons this is interesting is that if you build up planets while conserving the total mass, then... If you have more of them, yes. Right, yes. Of them. yes. So I guess we're trying to figure out what you can deduce about the mass distribution from the fact that you haven't seen anything uh, uh, yeah. Well, actually, I, I will get to that. I'm going to talk uh, towards the end about statistics, what, what we know today about the distribution from, from the observed events. Okay, but another uh, interesting way to look at this plot is to actually Rather, rather than look at the separation at this, uh, on the x-axis, normalize it according, somehow according to the mass of the, of the host star, yes? Yes, yes, yes. So, so of course, this is not for lensing planets. This is not really some major axis. It's the, it's the separation at the moment of lensing. Remember that, that the orbital motions and so on in planets take much longer than the time of duration of these microlensing events, which are weeks or months. Okay, so we, we always see a snapshot of the system. In a few systems, actually, orbital motion has been detected in the microlensing event, events that were long enough. Uh, <coughs> But in general, it's just a snapshot, so w w just we see, what, what we just see is the instantaneous projected separation of the planet. But yeah, if in a big enough sample, you'd expect that this in the end boils down to more or less the same thing, you know, up to a factor of order one. Um, okay, so let's now normalize this uh, separation by, uh, by, by something that's proportional to mass. Um, <coughs> And so what we see here now is the semi-major axis or separation divided by the snow line radius. Okay, that's just the name. It's not, I don't really mean that I know where the snow line is, especially the, as this refers to the snow line at the time of planet formation. But the idea is that if you uh, scale uh, this, some, some radius with, uh, with a mass to some power, as theories say uh, planetary systems form, there's some, some place where there's a snow line and more massive stars have the snow line further out. <coughs> uh, I think uh, what's been done here is just a linear scaling. Then you get uh, this, this interesting concentration of the microlensing planets all near the snow line, near one. Okay, and the reason for this is just, a, is just coincidental. Okay, it's because we saw that the Einstein radius scales like the, like the square root of the mass. Okay, and 
Microlensing is sensitive only to planets that are near the Einstein radius because that's where the lensed images are and that's, that's where images get perturbed. Okay? So if you divide this, this Einstein radius by some radius that's also proportional in some way to mass, that concentrates uh, planets in this region. So that's telling you, this is again probing uh, uh, a, a, very re a very interesting region of planetary space that's not probed that well by other methods of around a few AU around solar mass stars or one or two AU uh, around low mass stars. Now most lens stars are in fact uh, M stars simply because that's the most common type of stars there are and those, those are the ones that nature chooses for us to happen to give us a microlensing event in the first place that then we can look for uh, planets around. Um, so, 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 so we're basically looking, uh, the, the, the main thing that is probed in, in terms of planets by microlensing uh, is low mass stars in a region of around 1 AU, 1 or 2 AU around them. So this is again very interesting because that's a region that's not probed by other methods, not that well. Um, Okay, so today, as we have, have we seen, there's only a few tens of microlensing planets, and why why so few? Um, well, this partly it's because of what Einstein said. It's because the chance is so small, and you have to for, for every million stars that you you monitor, uh, you get just mi one microlensing event, and then only in a few cases of those do you actually get to see a planet, and uh, the the taking this into this into account. Until recently, the survey strategy has been one that was uh, outlined by, by Andy Gould and Avi Loeb, 1992, which said, well, monitor your millions of stars and look for those that are undergoing microlensing. And then among those, focus just on those that based on the beginning of their light curves, they look like they're going to be very high magnification. Okay. Why those? Because those, as we said, are the most sensitive to planets, right? Because you get an Einstein ring, and any planet around in that area will, get, will cause an anomaly in the light curve. So they're, 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 these, these are the ones that you should focus on, <coughs> and then follow them up uh, with very, very closely spaced observations to see that you don't get these deviations, these anomalies in the light curve. Um, and that's what actually people did for about a decade. Okay, so these uh, light curves that I showed you before, if you look at them, their magnifications are very big. Okay, this goes like from 18th magnitude to 13th magnitude. That's a factor of 100. Okay, so this is a magnification, 100 light curve. This is also, sometimes magnifications have been close to 1,000. So it's really stars that have, source stars that have passed almost directly behind, uh, behind the lens. Sometimes the lens actually transits the source. Very high magnifications, you're very sensitive. And then, uh, some planets have been found, okay? And these kind of surveys have been led by these two uh, projects. Uh, first, Ogle, Polish project in Chile, and MOA in New Zealand, both with uh, one two-meter class telescopes with large images. And they observed uh, the towards the center of the galaxy, towards the bulge, where, as we said, you have the highest concentration of stars, both as sources and as lenses that will pass along the light of sight to those stars. Uh, they simply tile this area with their large images. Um, and they observed every night. And that way, they detected about uh, a few hundred events every year during the <coughs> bulge season, when the bulge is visible. Uh, and as Gould and Loeb uh, outlined, uh, they then followed up the promising high magnification events with a global network uh, of, of telescopes, including many amateurs also, because when these things are bright, uh, you, you, can, you can see them even with small telescopes. Um, and, um, and this was a good strategy because, uh, as we said, high magnification events are, are very good because they're sensitive to planets. <coughs> and you get a high signal noise just thanks to the, all those extra photons coming to you thanks to the lens. Uh, but they're bad because, as we know, to get a magnification greater than 100, your impact parameter has to be less than 1 over 100, right? Remember that the magnification is approximately 1 over u, over the impact parameter. <coughs> and that means, since if you have a, a, a lens 
the chance of the source to pass at any impact parameter is, is equal, right? So it's a uniform probability of passing at any length. So, so that means that to get one in a hundred, you'll, you'll have only one in a hundred uh, light curves are good for this. Okay, one, of, one in a hundred uh, microlensing light curves will have an amplification of, of 100 or more. Okay, so if you take the few hundreds of uh, lensing light curves that you have per year, and you take only one in a hundred of those, that, that's just a handful, okay, and then not, not all, so you get something like seven events a year, but not all of them have planets, not all stars have planets near the Einstein uh, radius, then that led to the detection of one or two planets a year, and over the years that this was active, that led to about a dozen discovered planets. Okay, so as we already mentioned, you have also the, the more common magnification events or low magnification events, where you cross this planetary caustic rather than the central uh, caustic. So they're less efficient, but they're much, much more common. Okay, because here you're passing not within one hundredth of an Einstein radius, but just within you know, a few tenths. Okay, so this has the potential for discovering tens of microlensing planets a year, but the catch is that you have to monitor them very closely because remember the perturbation lasts just a short time, just a few days, according to the ratio of the masses, right? The square root of the ratio of the masses. Okay, so this is the idea. Uh, okay, for example, th this, this event, which actually was discovered by the first generation of lensing, this is a, such an example of a low magnification event. See, the magnification is only three. Okay, but there's a planet there. Uh, and to catch it, you really need this very close coverage, okay? This, this whole thing lasts just one day, okay? Because it's a Jupiter. Okay, so what you need is a network of, uh, of such telescopes with large images that you can actually measure, monitor the, the galactic bulge continuously for several months and therefore not miss any of these short events. So since 2011, we've been part of, uh, of a network that's done exactly that. Uh, this has been the project that was led by uh, my PhD, former PhD student, he's now JPL, Yossi Schwarzwald. Uh, by taking these two telescopes I already mentioned and combining them with our telescope here in Israel, WISE Observatory. <coughs> and together, uh, we can basically cover uh, the bulge this is the night sky uh, continuously for several months every year. Okay, observe, monitor uh, these microlensing events. We're not, not be sure that we're not missing any points. Okay, we're, we're we're up to the north. That's unfavorable for looking at declination minus thirty at the bulge. That's why our uh, our piece of the pie here is smaller. Um, okay, so here's again the galactic center. These are the fields of the various uh, of the, of the three observatories. Okay, so we have one common footprint that all of us cover, and we look at it continuously, 24-7 for several months. Okay, so this is, for example, uh, a real microlensing planetary event uh, that was observed in the course of this survey. So this is just the data from WISE, and here's the same event after, with the data from all three observatories uh, after they've been intercalibrated. So you see this very, very nice coverage, especially of the anomaly. There are some gaps, for example, due to the full moon when it sits right on top of the bulge. Um, okay, so here are some typical, uh, just plain low magnification uh, events, such as we're, we're after, with no anomalies. You can see the, the really complete and, and thorough coverage. And let's look at some of the actual planets that we've discovered. Okay, so this is one I, uh, I just showed you. Uh, this is... Uh, Again, these are data only from the, this second generation survey with the three telescopes, but it was also observed by other telescopes, so uh, they covered even better all the little features, but all, all the essentials are already seen just in our survey only data. So this is an example of uh, either a Saturn or a Jupiter around an M dwarf. Again, from this reconstruction of the light curve using the, the modeling for, with inverse ray tracing. Uh, Here's uh, another one, here's the light curve. Again, very nicely covered uh, with survey data <coughs> alone. <coughs> uh, this is a, a, a heavy Jupiter, about four, four Jupiter masses at an AU around a, a and, and it's actually around, this is sort of a solar, solar mass star, more or less, and it's, it's actually in its habitable zone. Um, 
Here's uh, another, another an analysis of an event that Yossi himself led. Uh, so this is uh, something on the border between a massive Jupiter and a, and a brown dwarf. Um, or a Jupiter, another Jupiter around an M dwarf. Uh, no, notice that, um, or, and here's one around a K dwarf. No, notice that one of, again, as, as I mentioned before, that uh, most of the, of the events themselves, the primary events, are due to a an M star being the primary lens. And what we're seeing is that in many of these cases, they do have Jupiter mass planets. Okay, so this is something that's somewhat in contrast to what is seen from other techniques. These uh, low mass stars, when you probe the snow line region, the few AU regions, they do have uh, Jupiters and more. Okay, here's a, another interesting event, again, covered uh, very nicely. Uh, it's uh, half, half a Jupiter mass, uh, three AU, so it's always the same region around a K, K dwarf. Uh, this uh, event was actually observed also from Spitzer. Again, at a separation of about one AU from, from us. So you can see very clearly this trigonometric parallax, okay? The peak of the event, and I'll, you can see a, a focus here on the, on the peak of the event, so this double horn and everything. It all happened about 20 days earlier as viewed from, from Spitzer. Okay, and again, this can be used to remove the degeneracies in the parameters. Um, another very interesting event, this is a, <coughs> a binary with a planet. Uh, it's uh, two M stars, 0.15 M sun and 0.13 M sun. And around one of them, there's an Earth-like planet, two Earth masses at about one AU. Okay, so this would be very similar, this would be habitable were, were, this, a, were this not an M star. Okay, it's actually quite cold. Um, so all, all the interesting uh, things that are, or, or similar things to what are found with other techniques are found by, by microlensing as well. Okay, so just some more of these examples of the many uh, planetary events we've found. Okay, so the last question I want to ask is to take all this together and ask the statistical question that, that Scott actually uh, asked before. <coughs> we have, we've done a survey. Now it's an ordered survey, not with this uh, alert and follow-up uh, uh, strategy that, that the first generation had, but rather we monitor a, whole, a large region of sky, millions and millions of stars, continuously for several months and then for several years. And we look at all the uh, lensing events, and then we try to answer the question, how many of them really have planets, and what are their characteristics? <coughs> so, as in any case in physics where you ask such a question of what is the true rate of something, uh, what are the true statistics of something, you need to, do a simula you need to simulate your exper experiment to determine what its uh, efficiency is. Okay, so that's what we've done. Uh, here you have all... 224 lensing events, just by the primary lensing events that have ent entered the sample over the four years we've run this experiment. <coughs> and now, uh, for every one of them, you want to know what is the efficiency of discovering uh, a planet around during that event, if it were there. Okay, and of course, this is different for every event because every event has a different signal to noise, uh, was observed with a different, somewhat different sampling, had different gaps, and so on. So for every event, we do what I described before in terms of the ray tracing. Okay, you put a pla planets with all sorts of different properties of separations, masses, positions uh, around uh, your lens star. You ray trace it, ray trace through the system. You produce these artificial lensing curves. Okay, and then you add the real sampling sequences and the, and the photometric errors to these things. Okay. <laughs> and then you run this through the same detection algorithm for lensing anomalies, for planetary anomalies, that we ran the real data through. And for every set of parameters, you calculate what is the detection efficiency. Um, so Yossi has done that, and this, is the, this shows the result. This is done individually for every light curve, every one of the 224 real lensing light curves. Okay, but you show that there's a large, you see that there's a large range of detection efficiency. Here shown is a function of the mass ratio between the primary star Wait, so and the planet. The what? Average. What is this? Average over the light 
this is the distribution for all of them. So for, for, for example, for this mass ratio, or minus 3, okay, it goes from here. This is the, the mean, and this is the 90 percentile, and this is 10 percent. So it's all, this is just for illustration purposes. What we use is the actual efficiency for each, for each light curve. Okay? And <coughs> we find the detection effici efficiency for each one as a function of this mass ratio. Okay? And then to calculate uh, the actual f planet frequency around stars that are probed by microlensing, for each mass ratio between the star and its planet, okay, all you have to do is to take the number of detected planets with that mass ratio, right here, and divide by the sum over the whole sample of the detection efficiencies. Okay, so imagine if we had always 100% 100 per, 100 efficiencies, and this would be all just ones, and it would be just the number that you see divided by the number that you looked at. Okay, but of course, if it's lower, then for every one you see, it counts as more. <coughs> uh, and he here are the results. Um, <coughs> so several interesting things here. Uh, the, first of all, the, the black, uh, the black histogram, the darker histogram, are the numbers that we actually see. Okay, overall, we saw 29 events with anom anomalies out of 223 microlensing events. And uh, if you now look at the mass ratio range, and you take into account that most of these, most of the host stars are M stars of about 0.3 solar masses, Okay, then you can translate this mass ratio range into an actual mass range, okay? So here's Jupiter, Neptune, Earth, and this is the brown dwarf, brown dwarf region. And over here in this bin, these are binaries, okay? These are close binaries, okay? <coughs> and after you correct this uh, figure for the efficiencies by, with a formula I just showed, you get this gray histogram, okay? So there's very large corrections here on top of small numbers, okay? The actual things in the planetary regime are only nine events, okay? So it's, you, you'd like to have more, but this is what we have at the moment, okay? But if you look at it now, you see that there's, uh, the frequencies of binaries are about 10%, which is what we also see from other techniques. <coughs> and if you look at, uh, at this side, okay, then you see that the frequency goes up as you go to smaller masses, lower mass, planets are more common than higher mass planets. Jupiters are quite common, around 5% or so, around these M stars that are probed by microlensing. Um, but brown dwarfs are also quite common, okay? This, just a second. Um, and there is a minimum here, okay? But it's not in the brown dwarf region. There's no brown dwarf desert as has been seen around FGK stars using radial velocities, okay? But there does seem to be a super Jupiter desert. It's not really, it's not really dry desert, but this is where the minimum between these two distributions are. Um, okay, this is very, very reminiscent of this plot from uh, 10 years ago by Grather and Lineweaver, okay, based on, on radial velocities of FGK stars, which shows very clearly the brown dwarf desert. Uh, I'll, I haven't forgotten you. <laughs> okay, only it seems that here when you're probing, uh, rather than at rather small separations and around solar-like stars, you're prob probing at lar somewhat larger separations around the snow line and around mostly M stars, it seems like the whole thing is shifted to the left to lower masses. Yes? Oh, uh, what is the error bar it's, it's just Poisson because it's very, it's very small numbers. Okay. okay? Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is, we we <laughs> never we never claim this is uh, significant. It's just su suggestive. Okay. But uh, yeah, I, I completely accept that that criticism. Um, okay. In terms of actual uh, actual, if you just sum sum these bins, the planet bin, uh, uh, for example, the Jupiter bin, where is it? There we go. Okay, so the, the Jupiter frequency is something like this. In terms of all <coughs> uh, ne Neptunes, they're about 10 times more, uh, more common, it seems. And together, it looks like about half, half of the 
stars that are probed by microlensing have uh, planets in the snow line region. Um, okay, this is, you want me to end now? Or I have one, or I can say one, one more thing about free floating planets. <laughs> Where, where's my wallet? <laughs> one minute. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned briefly at the beginning, uh, microlensing is the only technique where you can actually, because it doesn't, doesn't need le light to detect planets, it's using only gravity uh, and light from a background source, it's the only method that can detect free-floating planets. So, throughout these surveys, there have always been uh, these very, very short events that last only one or two days. These are two examples. Okay? Now, when you have an individual very brief event, you don't really know that it means that it's a very low mass object doing the lensing. Okay, because remember this time scale, uh, in, in this time scale enters not only the mass through the Einstein radius, but also the distance and the velocity. So it, it could be something that's simply very close to you or passing uh, very quickly across the line of sight, having high velocity or both. Okay, but on a statistical basis, this is a paper from several years ago by Sumi et al, by the Moa collaboration, you can see that, that there is an excess of these uh, uh, very short time scale events over what you would expect just from the known lensing populations. Okay? So if you take uh, the, all the, the population of all the things that could cause you lensing, okay, that's first of all, of course, you know, main sequence stars and brown dwarfs, that's shown here, okay, and it cuts off at one solar mass because everything here, that has already evolved off the main sequence and turned into white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. Okay? And now you fold that through the galactic distribution of distances of these things and their velocities, then you predict uh, this curve here. Okay? And these very short time scale events, okay, this is just a plot of number of microlensing events as a function of their time scale, their Einstein crossing time scale. Okay? You see this excess paper based on two microlensing seasons of 10 events that, have, that are shorter than two days, shorter or equal than two days, okay? And you can reproduce these things if you add a population of uh, free-floating Jupiters, but you have to make them very, very common, about as common or even twice or three times as common as the number of stars. So, so every, every star in the galaxy has ejected maybe one or maybe even three Jupiters sometime. And they're just floating out there in space and giving us these signatures. Uh, I'll skip this. So this is, uh, this is what I, the slide I showed in the beginning. So I hope I've convinced you that this is wrong, that microlensing is really great. It can answer all these questions, and it's not a black sheet. Well, it is a black sheet, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> okay, thank you. So to improve your uh, sensitivity to Earth mass planets or uh, also free floating planets, you need to go to higher cadence, right? Not really, no, because, uh, oh, oh, you want free floating Earths or just Earths? Both. Okay. No, I think the, the, the current cadences that are done today, just, just to give you the number, uh, the, the, for example, the second generation, we have like half hour cadences. Uh, so, so basically for... For four months, all these stars, these hundreds of millions of stars are observed uh, every, every half hour or so. That's, that's good enough to, to get Earths. Uh, what you really need to, in order to get more is to cover larger areas. Um, and, and, and go deeper. By, by, by going deeper with better observing conditions, better seeing, we're doing this for space, from space, for example, with W first, with Euclid, and in infrared, you can see simply more stars. You'll, you're effectively monitoring more stars. So that's, that's the way to increase your statistics. In terms of the sampling, we're, we're already there. Of course, you, I mean, you can, you can go even to shorter timescales if you want moons and things like that. Uh, that, that kind of follows on to my question then. Uh, so have there been any detections, or do you anticipate there being detections of exomoons using microlensing? So there haven't been any, um, and, and, and the question was, do, do I expect there to be any? Um, po possibly, 
okay? It's, it's, it's a matter of luck as well, and on, the f on, h on how many exomoons there are in general, which we don't know. Uh, but it, it, it might be possible, especially with, uh, uh, let, me, let me go back to this slide, which I skipped. Okay, you've heard a lot about uh, Kepler and K2. So starting in April, there's going to be a campaign towards the galactic center. Uh, uh, and and uh, this is geared specifically towards microlensing. So with the kind of precisions that you get from Kepler, that's actually a possibility. Okay, let us, uh, Ruth. With Gaia, will it be possible to predict any events in advance? No, <laughs> unfortunately not with Gaia, it won't be possible because, uh, because of the delay between the time of observations and till the data get down here. So it'll be, <coughs> it'll be too late. Oh, after, after the event is, yeah, yeah. To, oh, to predict a, a lensing event in advance. Yeah, yeah. If, if you knew a world the stars out, you could. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. I, I hadn't thought of that. We do that for objects in the solar system, right? To know when it fixes up and fixes up. Yeah, we've been doing it for thousands of years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let us thank Danny again. So uh, the hero of this talk was Einstein, I think. And uh, you may know that Einstein had some association with the Hebrew University. All his uh, original uh, papers and notes are being kept uh, here. Some of them are even in display down here, some in some archives in here. You guys get a lot of money for it, too. Uh, not, not that much. No, it's, I'm it's going down. It's not that much, yes. <laughs> um, and. Uh, also, uh, Lev, the guy behind us uh, here, stand up. Uh, lunch today will take place at the uh, same place it was not yesterday, but the day before yesterday, at the first day, okay? Both today and tomorrow. I won't come with you there, so follow some other guys. And <laughs> Lev uh, will take you to the next building uh, where the lunch is, where you can see the telescope donated to the Hebrew University by Einstein, okay? telescope that actually was owned by Einstein. You can uh, go and see it and we'll tell you some uh, stories about that uh, as well. Um, and uh, after that we have the uh, tour going to the old city. It's written on your uh, schedule at uh, 2. Yeah. And we'll meet, uh, you will meet, I won't be there again, at the main entrance to the, to the university right, right here. Uh, so have fun and we'll see you tomorrow.